recipes, but I'm probably going to snip this start, you know, because I think you know it's a bit. Of like a I have no idea like, at what point is it working or not. <clears throat> yeah. Oh no, you've gone. And. Um, Oh, hello, 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 hello. It kind of just went somewhere then. Yeah, it did, you know, and I'm even trying something different to like make it better. Uh, like I usually do these on my computer and it doesn't have a good camera and it has a terrible microphone and it's really hard to like get it high enough to like, you know, hide some of this. And uh, this time I'm trying my phone. It's actually on my easel. <laughs> I don't have a, <laughs> I don't have a thing. A mount? Do you call it a mount? Like a thing that holds your I camera? Had, I, I ended up buying this kind of like little mini tripod thing for phones for like 15 quid. Tripod, that's the word I was looking for. Oh. Yeah, and like it's good because it's fine for like a tabletop and then um, you can just angle it down a bit so it's less like like that and it's more like this. So this works a bit better because you can completely... Um, Maneuver it, alter it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole world of um, the amateur ability to like shoot a podcast or a thing, like I'm still in MySpace era. Like I haven't really used a webcam in a long time and I don't take a lot of selfies. So you just tune into anything and uh, you know, that ring light the tripods, the professional microphones. They don't make us pop hiss with their mouth because they got that perfect filter there. It's, and I'm a mess. I have no idea how they do it. I don't want to spend the money on any of that. No. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, welcome to, to episode zero. Uh, Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. Today's special guest, uh, Daphne Simpson, author, artist, general layabout i don't know i don't accurate. know what to say accurate layabout Lay layabout is accurate yeah <laughs> and uh we're gonna talk about art today i think uh we've got a handful of specific art pieces that we want to talk about but before we get into it i want to talk about talking about art because it's really hard um I do have some art history training and, and I've been around arts for a long time, but I still never got in the swing of things in the discourse of the ways people talk about art. For me, it was a lot more raw. Um, my mother was an artist and that was our common language as I started turning into those kind of preteen years where you say like, I don't want hugs. I don't want to be around my mom, but we can still talk about art. And uh, she's not a academically philosophy minded person when it comes to art. She was a natural, a very uncanny hand-eye coordination as a young person. And, and she could just look at a thing and then reproduce it in multiple different mediums, whether it was uh, graphite, chalk, oil paint, airbrush she could just make these things and um when we talked about art we really always talked about our feelings because like i said that was our our proxy language to have any kind of relationship at all and so we talked about what shades of red made you feel sad or what qualities of you know a smooth oil with a lot of linseed in there just how fine a feeling that was to flow or how frustrating it is when you make mud accidentally. So we could talk about feelings and we could talk about just the pieces of it. And when we talked about other people's artwork, there was just never any critique to it. Like we, I don't think there was ever a moment where she said anything about, well, the proportion is off on the angle or, uh, uh, the the colors uh, really don't have the vibrancy of his earlier work, or you know this is not as valuable. Or when he quit drinking, he really stopped making good stuff. Like she just she just talked about her feelings and impressions of those pieces, almost with no historical context. It is nice when you have a little bit of art history, though, to say, okay, the year that this was made, uh, this is particularly 
a specific reference. So when you see a pineapple or something in this portrait, it's not just because they liked pineapples, it's the signature of colonial wealth or whatever. So yeah, I get it, positing something within its, its moment in time, but I never really got over just having fairly naked reactions to art. Um, well, I can talk about what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling underneath it. If you act like a toddler, just keep saying, well, why, why, why? Well, I like it. I like it. I don't know. Something about it is speaking to me. And um, much like that kind of definition of music, that which is pleasing to your ear. For me, art, it's like that's pleasing to my eye or my, my, my fingers, you know, in a very like tactile kind of sense. Um, and I don't, I don't know, the rest is just kind of neat, but it doesn't form a hierarchy, right? talking about art or even talking about literature, I just don't see any value in making hierarchies of stuff as better or worse. And you see a lot of people uh, who are maybe at somewhere early in their career of drawing or sketching or artwork saying, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. I'm like, well, how better? Maybe, maybe what you did first was, was how you felt and how you perceived stuff. Maybe you've gotten better at reproducing a predominant style or something. So I just feel like we have a lot of these kind of value judgments on an individual living artist's work, is it getting better as they're practicing? Uh, and then rating art, categorizing it, uh, pop art, uh, no, this is more, this is vector-based content. You're making graphics, you're not even making art, uh, fine art, illustration. Uh, I swear, anytime someone says something about illustration versus not illustration. I think there's another word for the other thing. I have to Google it. I'm like, I don't know. I, oh, one tells a story. Well, what doesn't tell a story? Um, so yeah, I want to talk about how we talk about art and like your thoughts on this. Um, we could even touch on the values and the way art is treated in its filthy money kind of way, uh, you know, who gets celebrated and who doesn't. Um, but, you know, just, just to you for a second, if you have some opening um, thoughts on how to talk about art. So uh, one of the first things that's instilled in us when you do, when you go to art school is the language in which you frame art. And everything about art is its context. Like this, this everything is the context and the, the context you give it is around the language. So you have to catch on very quickly to the art Art of the bullshit and blagging everything because you by the time I was 18 I was jaded about art in that oh it's all bollocks it's just all well it's x y and z in mm. in these tones and okay fine so the value of art is about its context mm. and the narratives in which we weave around art were decided by a very specific set of people at a very specific time. And then anything outside that narrative has no value mm. to the art world, to art academics and people who write the books and teach at universities and deal art and they decide everything. And there's very little scope beyond that. If, it's, if you're not trained, it's outsider art. And then the nature of physical craft work and its inherent lack of value versus high art. And then, um, I mean, someone like uh, Picasso is really good for this. I hate Picasso. I absolutely <laughs> loathe him as a figure, as a person. <laughs> and I fucking hate his art. Excuse my language. If you need to beep it out, beep it out. I hate his art. And people are like, well, he's so important. Yeah, but was he? Mm. I have this theory, and I have this theory about music as well and, and other things. If that if that person wasn't there at that specific time, someone else would have filled the void. Mm. And the only reason we don't know about other Picassos is that the history books do not tell us and therefore do not value the work. Mm. Do you know mm. what I mean? There mm. was an there was a space in 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 whatever was going on that certain factors all kind of converged together to create this person and that art 
But if he wasn't there, it would have been someone else. And like you find this in how kind of misogynistic art history is, in that mm -hmm. a lot of women artists are not even remotely included as footnotes. They're er erased from art history. Mm -hmm. And yet a lot, some women were doing some things before old people, old mm -hmm. kind of white guys were in the mm -hmm. middle of France. Yeah. Yeah. Women were doing it elsewhere. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's eradicated. And then plus, you know, high art is also kind of colonial whiteness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and anything outside of this kind of European aspect of fine mm -hmm. art, I mean, even American art, Here's the thing, I don't know what it's like in, in the US, but like in here, there's this kind of snooty look down at American art. Mm. And even like great American artists, mm. whatever that means, it's all rather sniffy. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And, mm. and like, you know, I can apply the language of art in certain contexts. I can apply the context of why something is valuable to me. Or I can see it on a gr like a larger social scale, but it's not. It's beyond the money, and like, but but it, for everyone, for everyone around that world, right down to kind of like lecturers, it's about how valuable a thing is. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That was a bit rambly in my head. It was quite concise, but you know. No, I think that's the the perfect takedown of the the tower that's been propped up around us. You know that the empire wanted to show its extent of acquisitions, its mastery of uh, language and fixedness of it, like Oxford Dictionary. It was trying to say we've now evolved to the pinnacle of style, and this is it, lock, and we're done, and yeah. no one else gets in. And yeah, uh, whether I mean whichever angle you want to take it, um, you know, ec economic. Uh, bias, uh, colonial bias, racial bias, gender bias, like the Gorilla Girls, I mean, the, the stats are, are amazing, like 70% or something of uh, classical portraiture are female nudes, and, you know, 5% of, you know, portraits globally in museums are, are women, you know, are, are repeated by women. So it's like, Okay, you love their bodies, but you don't like they have this body. They could they could draw it perhaps differently than you know what you'd put in this gaze here. So yeah, that's um, I think you did a really great takedown that kind of hits all the basis on like why we have this problem. Um, talking about art, getting exposed to it. I was thinking about as you were talking, like what pictures that I what artworks that I pick to talk to you about, and why are they my favorite? And one. Uh, content warning, there's, there's, uh, it's a bit penis heavy, a lot of peen. Um, I don't know what was going on there, but perhaps it's like a knee jerk reaction to, am I going to sit? What do I have to say about another uh, female nude, Rubenesque or otherwise? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other hand, I thought, well, why are these my favorites? Oh, because I've seen them, right? I can only draw a circle of like preference and like what are the things I like if I've even heard of it and if it's never had distribution to reach my eyes I'll never even know and you can't even google that which hasn't been um, picked up right uh, so yeah uh, when people talk about what is the greatest which I hate any kind of like again hierarchy greatest book or greatest artwork well I think it's the some body of stuff not seen it's the dark matter of the creative world is that you know we have this sliver 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 that got picked up for acceptance and distribution by doesn't even need a conspiracy but ideological constraints and at certain times in history absolutely conspiracy absolutely control uh, so yeah even even looking at my choices i'm like i hmm Hmm, I could have picked something more rarefied. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting is that it's, it's when we talked about what we were going to do. These aren't even my favourite pieces of art. Right. So, um, like, my memory is bad. You know this about, about me. I, I forget a lot. And, and when you suggested this topic, I was like, okay. So I went and delved through my collection of art books and trying to remember things I'd seen, like, my my 
my favorite one of my favorite works isn't on here it's um but i saw it and i uh at um the new sensations exhibition it was the the Saatchi new brit art thing in in mm. like the late 90s and it was a big deal to see this exhibition people were like queuing up to get into it it was and um there was there, there was like the damien hurst shark was there it was like it was the big yeah. it was the, when it broke when it when it broke and there's an artist called gavin turk and he, he did this um elvis but it was um sid vicious kind mm -hmm. of manic the clothes on and it was just there's something so perfect about what that art was and i remember i mean i was like i can't even remember i was either like um 17 ish give or take and just i remember being completely blown away by this exhibition not because it was high art not because it was starchy and not because it was but because it was new and it really was to my tender innocent eyes so new and exciting mm. and everything do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so yeah i understand that totally yeah wow that must have been quite quite an experience you know. And it was because there was a painting there, and I can't remember the artist, but it was, um, it's Myra Hindley's face, you know, mm -hmm. you know Myra mm -hmm. Hindley, and, and it's all made with children's handprints. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful at a distance, this perfect portrait, and it's just these children's handprints. And somebody threw a can of paint on it, mm -hmm. and we were there just after it had been restored, right. Right. like... Um, cordoned off and everything. It was such an exciting exhibition. It really was fantastic. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that experience. Like when I've lived or visited uh, major U.S. cities that have a decent uh, museum, uh, you know, I, I go and and I really enjoy it. And I've had the opportunity to be really close up to pieces I like a lot, but. I'm like the only one there, <laughs> you know, it's like a Tuesday afternoon, <laughs> no major exhibits um, of anything new and vital. Uh, I don't know, I was always kind of scared of the new, you know, so like I spent more time at, you know, the Frick the, versus like the, the MoMA, you know, like the modern art was kind of inaccessible to me a little bit, you know, mm. I, I still okay. kind of struggle. <clears throat> I, when I was a, a teenager, I think I think the reason why art galleries were, I think I'm a bigger fan of art galleries than I am of art. Like mm. when I was a teenager, like 15, I lived at the end of the Central Line in London. So I would just go in on my own on a Saturday and just like spend an afternoon at like the National Gallery in it, or the Tate or anything. And I would just while away hours just wandering around like the same galleries and mm -hmm. I just I always felt very at home there particularly when they were quiet I preferred them when they were quiet mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. there's no people in the way, you know oh yeah yeah it's it's like a bookstore like that kind of <laughs> probably bad for business but really great for the people that are there you know this place where you, you can hide because you're safe here. If there is someone else here, they're here to see the art and they're not going to give you a hard time. Um, and it should be unhurried. You know, this isn't some sort of scavenger hunt spree. Run through. OK, we got to get an impressionist. OK, we check one and run through. Like, no, no, really take your time. Enjoy it. Um, yeah, so. I'm probably not going to show uh, the pieces that we're going to talk about. I thought okay. about it, and even though they're findable online, I don't really know that I want to get into a copyright disclosure for the reproduction of them. And if this goes just to an audio podcast for some listeners or the, the, the vision impaired, uh, let's just describe it as best we can. So picture, we're um, looking at a, uh, we're drafting a tweet and we're attaching a image and we're good stewards of our community so we say enter in alt description and um i'm going to take a stab at some and maybe you can help me describe some of them too um before we talk about them so i think describing it can be flavored with like you know adjectives of what you like about it um or you can just really try to describe it for someone that that's not looking at it 
Okay, let's let's get get into the the pieces. Okay, <clears throat> so this first one is one I I, I shared with you. Um, I looked up the date of when it was made in 1998, and I must have come across it not long after that. Like it was either 98 or 99 the first time I saw it, and I I know um, where I was at and and who showed it to me and. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, Takashi Murakami's um, My Lonesome Cowboy. Oh. I was visiting my friend, uh, Krista Gardiakos, and she is a terrific artist, uh, majestic work herself. And she was such a gateway person for me into, I don't know, discovering a world outside of my bubble. I was sorely lacking education when I met her. I just didn't know anything about anything. And um, so she said, hey, come over here. you got to see this. And so it's a sculpture, but what she had were a series of still images. Uh, there's a figure, a male figure, standing with his legs spread. Uh, his... His body reminds me of the leanness of a, a Rodin sculpture, um, you know, kind of a, a youth. And let's see, he's got an anime face, blonde hair, almost like a Super Saiyan, uh, big eyes, a look of like exuberant anime joy. And what he's doing as he's standing with his legs spread on this platform is completely naked. And there is a white lasso spinning up out of the head of his penis, uh, his hand gracefully guiding it as it lassoes up above him in this loop. <laughs> Obviously, it's like this great rope of ejaculate. 1998. Um, I had not really seen a lot of anime. I guess I had seen like Sailor Moon. I was aware. Uh, there was maybe like one manga I had read. Like I knew that it was around, but you were still just as likely in the United States and Chicago suburbs to hear people say, I like Japanimation. You know, like uh, anime hadn't really like taken on like a term that could describe something from multiple different countries or agnostic of country and more about a style, right? Um, huh. Yeah. So I'm looking at this thing and it's so radical. Maybe this is what you were kind of, feeling when you went to that that major exhibit so yeah i saw a lot of art as a kid i saw female nudes occasionally there's a male nude and what do we know about sculptures of a male nude well um if no one's broken off their nose they've definitely broken off their penis and if they have a penis it's very, very you know discreet um it's not there to offend your eyes uh I mean, Greek and, and Romans had large phallus figures, but they're hidden. You know, you, you really have to, like, know where to look to, to find them. And so here's this figure, not in an act of shame, not in an act of dominance, not in an act of using a penis as a weapon. It's like, I'm happy. I'm a lonesome, <laughs> I'm a lonesome cowboy. I don't know. It's, there's just something so exuberant about it. And I couldn't. I don't even know that Krista told me anything about it. Uh, she said, look, look at this thing. Isn't this amazing? And uh, I remember getting that chest feeling of like when you like meet someone and you think, oh, I might fall in love instantly with this person. It's so strange. It's not erotic. So nah. I think it passes any kind of like, is this for, it's it's what we call now fan service. Like I don't think it's hentai. I, I don't know. It it's astounding. I'm not even sure how its dimensions. Um, I like to picture it being like you know ten feet tall, but <laughs> I'm sure it's probably diminutive. Um, one of the things I'm gonna um talk about on another piece is mm -hmm. um, things that you've mentioned before is is the difference between the female figure and the male figure. And mm. generally, male figures aren't de depicted as sexual objects in the sense that women are. Mm. And there tends mm. to be, in a male nude, two forms. It's hyper-masculine, but non-sexual, as in just strong. 
and the other one is extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And yet this is neither of those things. And yet at the same time, it still isn't sexualized, which is a really rare balance. And I think it's the stance, it's the proportions of the figure as well. And then, and you're right, it's just so happy. It's so funny. <laughs> but, like, but not like, not as in unintentionally, oh my God. It's like, it's fun. Like, um, there's an artist, uh, David Meish, and he does mm. these teddy bears with chainsaws. And they're just so much fun. They're hilarious and joyful and yet also something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I was, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, they not sexualized it. But... Like, there is somebody erecting this happiness. I think guys don't really talk about how goofy and wonderful penises are. <laughs> you know, you never they're, have to they're... talk about that. No, you just, you just not. It's not. These bits are funny. And I remember, like, the first time you do, like, a, a live drawing class, and it's a man, and it's not a woman. You're, everyone's like, oh, my God, we're all going to see a penis. Because you're all about, like, 17, 18, and you're just like, oh, my God, this is really... And it's like just some old guy who's just like, all right, and then he's just like nuts out, and you're like, okay, and you just don't know, should you laugh at that thing? And like, I don't know, it was because it's completely non sexual, there's no intimacy in those moments, it's really odd. And because I think, and part of that is the fact that you just don't see men's bodies as much as just honestly as you do women's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're less commodified and I think that's a real thing about this is you know commodification I suppose oh look there's the art of the blag again yeah uh, let's move on to the the next one here also penis of a story so this is a photograph um, prior to an exhibit. And I don't even know the details on that, so I, I probably could have Googled. I'll put it in the links um, because I'm not going to fiddle with my computer now, but it's uh, Gomez Pen, uh, Saul Garcia Lopez, uh, and the photographer again, and I'll put the credit when we go on there. The photograph, two male figures against a red background kind of a kind of a clay stained backdrop uh one figure is wearing a headdress though i don't know the detail it looks evocative of um the tribes of mexico uh, he's topless his chest is tanned he has a, a tattoo partially obscured he's holding a pickaxe in his right hand his left hand, uh, elbow away from his torso, hand pointing towards his hip, not pointing a finger, but fingers outstretched as if kind of directed the gaze, like, look, this is, this is my body. He's wearing a, looks like a skirt made of punctured leather as something you might see in 90s um, industrial or bondage communities, like kind of a riveted metal, uh, what I would think is like a rock belt. Uh, he's got fishnets covering from elbow to wrist. He's got what appears to be a penis gourd, perhaps an elephant trunk penis gourd or just a wrapped penis gourd, uh, black leggings, and a very shiny patent leather shoe with a high heel. I'm not versed enough in shoes to be able to describe what that type of heel is, but his uh, left leg is cocked to the side, even though he's standing facing forward to show that. Uh, immediately beside him, a figure mostly uh, nude, save a sombrero, uh, another penis gourd covering of a sort uh, with green leaves, looks like a plant, and uh, very stylized uh, boots with a long, long toe. Again, I'll have to get the name of that, um, but I do know the name. But his figure is 
pale, painted white, pasty. He's holding a, looks like an antler in his left hand uh, and his gaze uh, straight at the camera, uh, eyelid you know, half closed, uh, not menacing. I think both have a gaze of, of challenge. Mm. And so here's what I, my first impressions when I, when I see this, um, you know, I think of colonial interference and then eventual uh, integration with friction of, of indigenous cultures. We've got multiple calls to both. And I think the Chicano experience, the experience of, of linguistic colonialism, even in the absence of genetic, but just the impacts to culture and the mergers is really interesting. And I think about that because I talk a lot about how the modern United States policy towards uh, what we call Latin America immigration is almost exclusively about indigenous peoples. And if we phrased it rather than uh, Spanish speaking Latinos coming across the border and just phrased as if we did speaking about um, Alaskan pipelines or other uh, pipelines into native territory, you know, indigenous people blocked by border from their traditional sacred lands. Like that's what it is. Uh, there was no border. There is a total permeation between all of the Americas historically over potentially in some regions, 40,000 years. There are linguistic and archeologic and genetic milia bonds between all of the Americas up and down. Uh, it's not so discreet to say, well, uh, because your deep roots lie in some Aztec or Toltec group, you have no claim to further north. No, people got around all the time um, based on myriad reasons. And, and that's really what's happening is you're blocking indigenous people from access. Um, I, I, I applaud all efforts and I have no authority to speak on the nomenclature that arises to describe, you know, Black, indigenous, people of color of the, the Americas, uh, whether they prefer uh, Latinx or Latine or any kind of nomenclature. Um, but I really think that it's, don't cover up the fact that, that it's also indigenous. Uh, I think that we can just even look at the enforcement policies on who's allowed and who's not. It's really targeting. Um, Mestizo individuals, uh, or just plain out, you know, full, as people used to say, full blood natives, but from Latin America. Uh, that's who's not being let through. Uh, it's not, you know, from Buenos Aires, uh, heads of industry that can afford to buy a room in Trump Tower. So I look at this piece and I just see the whole picture. I see, I see, you know, 500 years of colonial uh, interference and yet still the persistence in that gaze of saying, no, I'm, I'm still myself and look at me. Um, the, the nudity here, the, even the penises here, I feel like are powerful and to me, a form of masculinity that's absolutely masculine without being offensive to me, um, without being hyper-masculine, without being um, what I think of as like the, the Greek and Roman uh, what turned eventually into muscular Christianity, even heck, muscular Christs, right? Look at the abs on that, like everything is so strong and your virtue is tied to this physical strength and I hate it, but these guys, uh, these figures possess so much strength in pose and it doesn't matter that there's not some obscenely, uh, you know, ripped muscles or something or tiny head, huge body <laughs> thing. Yeah. I'm done ranting, okay. <laughs> um, somebody with literally no qualification to speak on any of that whatsoever. Um, that come the colonialism comes through. Like the colonialism is just it's so loud mm. in that and um, that um, conflict. When when you first uh, showed me this, that's exactly what I thought. Well, it's like it, it's really strong. It's really powerful, and it's um. Like just on a um, on a 
visual aspect without the context of it that gives it its value just mm -hmm. on that the exact placing of every line is so perfect like mm -hmm. beyond what it is beyond what it's saying mm -hmm. the the curve of the shoes mm -hmm. versus the curve of the hat and the how it balances itself out is like a classical it goes all the way back kind of um enlightenment structure it's mm. it's right there mm. that gives it a kind of real solid power that mm. enhances its yeah it's it's a really striking piece of piece of art it really is oh i love it <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for looking at that with me. I mean, it's it's funny, you know. You show you ask somebody um, listen to the song and they'll play a three minute song and say, oh, "I liked it or I didn't like it." I say, uh, uh, "Would you like to read this book?" And then maybe they'll read it, maybe they won't, and they'll eventually say, oh, "I like the ending or I didn't like the ending." And, and yeah, artwork is almost like poetry. Um, <laughs> you can show it to somebody and they're just going to have like either no reaction <laughs> or just like, I don't, they're so uncomfortable with talking about what they see or what they feel or they think they maybe don't, maybe somebody embarrassed them once, you know, when uh, they said like, well, that's not how you talk about it. So they just quit. Um, it is such a privilege to hear your thoughts on these pieces, uh, to have a friend to talk about art with, I mean, I have no disparagement of people that can't or don't, oh, but it's so it's nice. A, it's a weird thing for me because I haven't been able to talk about art, which I will talk about, oddly. But I, I, I don't, I don't experience art again anymore. I don't go to galleries, current mm. you know, circumstances aside. I don't think about art. I don't, don't look at art in a way that I used to. Whether it used to, it was my my whole life, and now it's now it's not. So this is. Yeah, this is nice. This is it's good to try and remember. I've lost a lot of the the language, the culture of art that I they used to, you know, lead. But you know, it was it's it's good to to revisit those things and find some of those words again. Yeah, I, I can I can imagine. I mean, mm. for different reasons, you know, I I lost touch with anyone that I would have gone to galleries with and <clears throat> I think I mentioned her before but uh Krista she and I would have art nights where we would have anywhere between five to a dozen friends over and how is this different than other parties uh well we are gonna drink um we're gonna listen to music but we're also you know one person might be camped out making buttons with a button press another person might have the the canvas open uh, everybody was just creating something and it wasn't a competition and we weren't going to display things at the end and it wasn't geared up towards the creation of a gallery showing we just made art and we just talked art all the time and that was i don't know more than 10 years ago <laughs> and i never thought i would have that again yeah, yeah. different reasons same kind of kind of similar place of <clears throat> rediscovering the lexicon um the discourse i'd like to kind of skip some of the ones i had thought about just in the interest of time and get to, to the uh, pieces uh, you you proposed if that's all right yeah. uh, first is the, is the piera so this is a really interesting one for me i've, I've never seen it. i've never been to it i haven't seen it but um the first time i saw this was um just randomly in a book and um i think the reason i i love it and i and i kind of quite like baroque um paintings and and sculpture is that there's a gaze to it that is loving and serene and beautiful and not sexual but pure not because of Christianity, I'm an atheist, but like you'd set that aside. There's, it's in the light and it's in the 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 look on on Mary's face. On, but it's just this vulnerability. And it was the first time I'd really looked at a painting and 
not just seen, but felt the real vulnerability of a man. And mm. like, because media is so, like the, what we've already been talking about, is so hyper-masculine hyper or toxic masculinity or misogynistic, mm. or women can only be seen, this kind of soft female form can only be seen as vulnerable. Or it's and it's weak, and then the, the dichotomy between strength and weakness and vulnerability and just is very interesting to me how it all slots together, particularly mm. how we gaze upon male forms and female forms. So that's really the the only reason. I mean, it's not my favourite painting by mm, right. any means, but it was one of the first that I really understood male vulnerability. Mm-hmm. When when about in your life do you think you saw it? Oh, it was like 15, 15, something like that. Mm-hmm. And who were you? Who were you then? Oh. Oh, yeah. Awkward. <laughs> really <the> shy. <laughs> really, really in really quiet, really shy, really traumatized, really damaged. Um, but like no, I would have been 16. I would have been 16 um, because there was a, oh God, I remember, I remember there was a bookshop where I lived. It was a secondhand bookshop and I just bought, started buying I'm, uh, art books because that's when I was kind of getting ready to go to kind of like, um, we called it FE College and I was doing this art course. So I started buying all these art books. And I saw it in that and I think it was the book was like a couple of quid and I was so enthusiastic about all this art and I was um I had no friends. I had um not a lot really, just kind of sad to be honest. That's who I was a bit. Mm. It was before I started being really bad at everything, like wild. That was it was just before wild. So yeah. So with that, you saw a figure of a male, vulnerable, in recline, strong, twisted, doesn't really look broken um, as, in terms of like a tortured body. But like if we took away the context of Christianity, you know, uh, we wouldn't necessarily think these two are lovers, but we definitely see a man who's receiving some form of love care you know like an essential like oh i love you kind of thing from a woman <laughs> was there a romantic sense when you saw this i mean no just, no no this ah uh, it's it's really hard for me to articulate that sense of it was just care it's just care, soft right. It's just a gentle care for another human being in a vulnerable position. So interesting. So you say that, I see that. And this morning, um, very early my time, like 5 a.m., uh, I, I signed in uh, to Twitter and Jesse Stewart, author, artist, uh, academic, had said very nice things to me <laughs> about my work and shared that publicly. And I felt that description you just gave as what's represented in this, this scene. And <clears throat> so I then shared several art pieces I made uh, around my book series like that, um, where I tried to capture that moment in, in visual art and in uh, text. And one of the pictures where I, I mean, I flat out based the first major scene in the little demons inside around this moment with uh, Jesus and uh, and Mary, like where you Henry is lying down at a gas station having a seizure and she kneels beside him. Oh, no, I mean, that's it's that moment. It really is. Now you say it, I can. Yes, it's. Oh my. God. <laughs> um, but the one I was thinking about comes after that in the series uh, where three people take a shower together and it's not a sexual scene and uh, though two of the people in this shower uh, cuddle puddle are, are lovers this isn't a scene about lovers but all three are in a complete warm embrace they've just come off a really uh, 
heavy drug trip and they're bound to each other, deep friendships, intimacy forged on the road. And that sending love care at somebody and a, and a hug in a shower, just, I just thought like, that's, that's how I felt receiving kindness from Jesse this morning. And that's like a sentiment that maybe like you, it's really hard to explain. <clears throat> and I don't like getting caught into ropey discussions on, well, there's five different types of love in classical Greek, uh, eros and you know, philos yeah. and agape. Like, I don't care. And I don't like modern Christian thought on there's five love languages. Like, why is it always five? But there is like this form of affection that is so beautiful. And it's the one I value the most. And it's unique and it feels so good. <laughs> and um, yeah, I could see that in this, this piece. And, um, and I, I, try, I, I guess I tried to replicate it. It's, it's so a, interesting that we chose today and that that same exact image set came up for me. Yeah, it's, um, there's a soft depth of it in, in when somebody is in that, I mean, I didn't think it then, I was mm -hmm. too young to understand it then, but I may be on some kind of subconscious level, but when somebody is physically so vulnerable, mm -hmm. emotionally as well, and then you are either on the receiving end of any care mm -hmm. or the giver of that care, it's a deeply profound, exchange and it, that bond that comes from those moments transcends any other kind of obvious physicality and mm -hmm. what like you say like the standardized definition mm -hmm. of what love is it's you know mm -hmm. it's important and I think I must have understood that on some level as somebody who hadn't really received mm -hmm. Those kind of because I one I was too young, two I didn't have any, but like I I must have latched onto that because it's something that that image has stayed with me. Specifically, this depiction of it has stayed with me for mm -hmm. many years, many years. God, that's fascinating. That is so mm -hmm. fascinating. <laughs> and it, and it's funny. It's one of the first ones that popped into my head when you said, "Let's talk about art." And I hadn't thought about this piece of work for a long time, for a really long time. So it's nice to rediscover it again because I don't, obviously, like I said. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, your next, which was an uh, illustration of the character Death. Um, created by, uh, I guess, um, Neil Gaiman, illustrated by the Dave McKean. Yeah. So this brings us on to my obsession with Dave McKean that I had um, when I discovered Salman. I wrote my dissertation on Dave McKean. <laughs> I had to persuade... No pressure. No pressure. Um, I had to persuade my... Um, uh, what are they called? When they teach you at uni, what are they called? Lecturer, um, to, to let me do this. I mean, this was the year 2000, going into 2001. Mm -hmm. So, and it was something absolutely pretentious, like mm -hmm. um, the digital visual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A case study of Jamie McKinney. It was so mm -hmm. ridiculous, so pretentious. But I, particularly this one, particularly. I was tender young goth, like 17, so it's probably like 97. This oh, oh crud. <clears throat> You've got to describe it. <clears throat> describe it, or I will. I think I missed the last one. we got to do it for our uh, uh, right, description. Yeah. So it's of a photograph of a woman um, with her head arched back. She's wearing black, and um, a, an ankh at her neck is quite vivid. She's got black hair. There's the hint of some makeup, but the image is slightly blurred and faded and it's overlaid with kind of scraped away, dirty looking kind of black paint um, that frames her. There are very analog pieces in that scraping, right? It looks very, yeah. Yeah, very physical. Yeah, 
Well, that's that's how he worked. He originally, oh, God, I know it, it's really sad. He he was a photographer and painter and mixed media, and he would often create these kind of like collages and then photograph the collages, and that would be the final work. So he would paint something, he would photograph something, he would paint over it, he would create these kind of like I think um he actually made like dolls houses and then like flat and then painted them and photographed them and worked on the photographs so he would do this kind of really grungy almost kind of like mixed media work um I was a tender young goth when I discovered Sandman and became as many of my ilk did obsessed uh, at 17 and uh just God, adored it um, I was this image particularly because um, also at this age I kind of had an obsession with um, <laughs> with Monk and uh, um, Munch and uh, I can never say his name and um, and the Scream and uh, mm -hmm. his Madonna and just. Mm -hmm. I saw echoes of everything in echoes because I was discovering art for the first time and just became sadly obsessed with it. I've even got like a print of this somewhere um, out of a book when I discovered a colour photo photocopier. And um, but the reason I was obsessed with, with Dave McKean was um, primarily because he wasn't a fine artist. He was a for want of a better word, a pop artist, mm -hmm. in that he did lots of um, commercial work as well, and he did adverts and album covers and um, comic book covers, and he was a writer and he was a storyteller of all different of all different kind of medias. So that was the thing that I liked most about him. It wasn't just here is this artist that you're allowed to like in the language that you're allowed to like it. It's that he was this guy saying, no, you can do comic books and you can do photography exhibitions and it's all valid. Like my whole, because I went to see a photography exhibition of his, of his fine art photography. I was very lucky enough to see it in person and they were beautiful. They were these beautiful big photographs and, and they were so interesting um, and properly gorgeous work and he also does like album covers for uh nine inch nails not nine inch nails okay. but on assembly and uh i just liked the fact that he was this kind of like commercial working person and also a fine artist and he was like no you can be all of these things mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely well it's <clears throat> I've always loved comic books and I think you and I both kind of saw that in our coming of age, that turn of respect for comics as art and comics as literature, because it really wasn't there. And I think it's not a coincidence that an artist like McKean and an and, uh, author like Gaiman are both part of that exact same movement. You know, some of his comics, Salmon received some of the first graphic novels or comic book, silly book, um, uh, awards uh, that had previously just only gone to, to literature. So I think they were groundbreaking in, in both regards in terms of changing acceptance. I mm -hmm. think that there were, they were not groundbreaking in terms of making it first like creating it uh, just in terms of acceptance. But I do really like his work and I always did. Um, I, I had a steady diet of Marvel and DC comics as a kid. But, you know, you, in the States, what, what you would do is your, your parents take you to the grocery store or your grandparents take you to the grocery store. And like at a very early age, you just say, can I go read the comic books? And you just stand in the aisle unprotected while your adults go awesome. shopping for you and then they come back and pick you up hopefully um and so i would just read all my comic books there and uh you get used to a certain bold line muscular figures cover and i still really like 
comic book covers from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, but I do remember, yes, yeah, 17, 16, 17, somebody, I think a girl I like saying, Sandman, have you heard of him? I'm like, whoa. And, and just seeing what some of these fringe presses or subgroup presses for major companies were opening up um, in terms of what you could do visually. And yeah, it was so different. Uh, it was a little scary because the people I knew that were into Sandman were themselves a little scary. It's kind of dangerous, and I don't know. <laughs> like it was just part of the paraphernalia of like entry into this, and um, and I really liked it. And I liked that there was there's so much drama, even in the piece we're looking at here. Um, as you described the figure, and it's all in gray tones, look like silver metallic tones. So there's there's carbon black that looks scarred up, a silver, and then this figure that is so dramatically a uh, head cast back, uh, body shrouded in darkness, obviously feminine in, in some types, but it, you know, you see very little indicia of that. Like you, you would take a guess of that. It's just very dramatic, very gothy. And then it's titled Death. It's about a character who's the embodiment of death, who in some iterations is just a cute goth girl who is cute, but also kind of dangerous you know i don't know it just it's part of this whole paraphernalia of taking yourself too seriously which people subsequently would come to reject like can you believe we ever took ourselves that dramatically I'm like i still do I'll, i always will i always will i am not embarrassed by it the pretense of walking into a goth club like you are a vampire aristocrat even though like you work a day job, day job like yeah we know this is fake we know it's fake you don't have to like rub it in but here i get to act really cool <laughs> oh yeah. yeah yeah so i i see the image and it just brings it all right back like what did exactly. i love about goth yeah you know it's being 17 and being completely outrageous and there being no one else that you know, because I was the only goth. Like there wasn't just like a few that I was the like, there were no. <laughs> oh. And oh, so sad. And oh, being there's like, so many self-taught you... moments in that too. <laughs> I know. I can only imagine. And there's no YouTube to help you. You didn't have a makeup no. tutorial. No, I mean my my brother was a goth and mm. uh, he introduced me, but we weren't um like in the same area or anything so he lived in northampton which for england in the 90s uh, in the 80s and 90s was uh, the home of the goths it was just like goth central it was just all but goths and there's just goths on every street corner but like whenever i went there i was like oh my god look at all the goths and uh, it was all so exciting <laughs> And to go to goth clubs, and they weren't just goth clubs, they were goth pubs, and it was just this whole world that was open and exciting. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh God. So much fun. Oh. And, and all the goths would just get together, okay. and they'd just get ready together like little birds, and we'd all, like, put the makeup on and do each other's eyeliner, and then, oh, I like your corset. No, your corset is nicer, and then, oh, it was just such a good time. It was. What I really loved about the high drama of it is that even if the person wasn't actually interesting, they put on a good effort to pretend to be interesting. And people just don't pretend to be interesting anymore. No, this is this is the thing. And it was just like, you know, the, the truth of it was like Nigel from Accounts. Nigel from Accounts <laughs> night was just the king. Do you know what I mean? And everyone loved Nigel from Accounts, even though Nigel from Accounts never spoke because it was cooler that way. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 <sighs> yeah. Good times. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really was. But there was such an ecosystem around it to feed it. So you had your books, you had your authors who were writing in that, you had Poppy Zebright, you know, it wasn't just Anne Rice. You could go like levels down to like, grittier more interesting it felt under it felt like there was a bit of counterculture and yeah real world politics were part of it you know you hate the government at all times but there was also such a huge acceptance like there was still a lot of at least 
in the goth communities I saw in the States, a huge overlap with the Rocky Horror communities, the uh, um, drag communities, and general like freaks and weirdos, like your, your, your punks and your rivet head industrial kids and your goth kids, they were really allies and it was a huge bastion um, for, uh, for runaways who are having trouble at home, uh, for uh, acceptance or exploration of different sexualities. Uh, I just felt really welcoming and looking scary and obscene to adults and the government and, and normal people. Yes, ostensibly there's a middle finger to society, but I found it really welcoming um, once you like kind of get past the gate. And it's the, the gate was, was the way you look like, it was always armor to me. It was like a filtration system. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. if you couldn't handle the armor, then you weren't the right person mm -hmm. for this mm -hmm. space. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and anyone who's like, oh, well, like, well, you're kind of probably the person who would pick pick on me anyway. So you're mm -hmm. not the one for me. So mm -hmm. off you go. And then somebody's like, oh, my God, your boots are cool. So I'm like, OK, we're friends now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know that being my age, I was well into second wave goth, right? You know, um, I, I was born in 1980, 95 in, in the Chicago area. There was still like a lot of goth activity in that kind of 90s revival. Um, but I know I wasn't there in the beginning. And uh, elder goths were always really generous and snooty and snooty. But it's really hard now because I want to be more generous but they don't have an ecosystem of actively created uh, like Cleopatra records. They're not actively creating Waxworks records. There's like a lot of media that's not around that we had access to. Um, like don't, you know, Gaiman, you know, makes like kids books and Clive Barker makes kids books and you know, everybody's kind of, uh, and they have opinions. They're all way, everyone's way overexposed on social media. So it's really hard for someone to be like a, da, a dark, Goth Lord, because we know everything about their sandwiches they had for lunch and there's no mystery. And so I see almost exclusively young women. It's really weird. Um, like, don't know where the goth boys are, but young women uh, adopting the imagistics of the prior waves of goth with absolutely zero of the content or culture. Like, they're not interested in, in goth stuff. They might tag something witty shit. They might tag goth styles. And yeah, they, they kind of have a bit of that retro flavor. It's not just wearing black, but they're doing something. But I'm not saying, oh, well, you don't know anything about it, but there's, you really don't. Like your interests are just what's on Netflix generally. Yeah. Um, yeah I don't know, it's kind of weird. I mean, there's always been like the baby bat subculture, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. coming new into it. Like, oh, look, bless the baby bats. Oh, aren't they precious? Mm -hmm. They don't know things. and mm -hmm. But that, like you said, that they aren't the kind of the, you know, the elders that kind of the baby bats would mm. flock around and kind of mm. learn how to be like, it's like animal, we're just so animalistic. It was so funny I mean, when you think about it, just learn oh, yeah. how to be the older goths and, and oh, then so like, embarrassing. oh my God, yeah. So, so no, there isn't, it's, yeah. I don't and know, it's like, fine, I'm, it's fine. It's just weird, like, yeah. okay, I mean, it's it's image, but you don't like the, there's no goth music. So you like goth image, but you don't like goth music, even though, most artists would say, well, we weren't goth, we're the cure. Like, fuck you, okay? Like, with the broadest net. Because some people, like, I was just reading yesterday, an old friend of mine uh, who still makes uh, uh, industrial and digital music and has always been, he just never really left the scene, had a Facebook argument, 2021, Nine Inch Nails is for, you know, babies who don't like real industrial. I'm like, oh, I haven't heard that in a long time. Oh. You're still, you're still holding on to that, you know? Um, I'm not saying what you listen to or who's included or not included, whatever has, has any kind of valid gatekeeping function. It's just really weird mm. that 
you're, you know, there's a lot of people online with their their big titty goth girlfriend meme image that don't like anything related to any other aspects of goth except for the the look. Mm. Not not a single album, not a single nothing. It's weird. Like it's not yeah. a movie, it's not a music. Uh, it's an aesthetic, not, right. not right. a culture. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, things change, but it's, it's, but it's theirs. It's not mine anymore. It's theirs, so they can do with it what they want. Yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Just musings of somebody that's getting old and not out of touch. <laughs> uh. Well, I suppose we should probably uh, say goodbye. Um, thank you so much for doing this with me today. Uh, Thank you for having I me. Really, really enjoyed myself, and um, I hope you did too. I did. It was really nice. And I said we would not get to everything. No, <laughs> no, you never do. This has been great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Well, I look forward to doing another one. Um, enjoy the rest of your 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 day, and happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> <laughs> <Bye>. Stopping. <laughs> <laughs>